Well, this whole video is going to be full of ship. I hope that pun worked. Maybe it didn't, but you know, whatever floats your boat. Norther, though, god of ships and seafaring, is associated with fishing, wind, and the wealth of the sea. His home is Noatun, the harbor or boathouse, and he's a deity with only a handful of attestations among the Eddas and sagas, but it seems that he filled a very important place in Norse society, even if it seemed to diminish later with the rise of Freyr, his son. It's no surprise that Njorthr, the god of ships, would be associated with wealth. The sea is a great source of wealth. Eir, Jotun of the oceans, the husband of Ron, the sea goddess of death, was also associated with wealth, as great wealth was contained within the oceans, as well as within the ships that Eir would take from Njorthr with his jaws. Sailors might find themselves under Njorthr's domain on their ships, but under the jurisdiction of Eir, and Ron should they go overboard, or should the ocean invade the bounds of the ship. One might think the relationship between Eir and Njorthr would be a contentious one. However, we do see Njorthr within the hall of Eir, in the ocean depths, as a welcome guest. Many coastal societies would depend on trade and the sea harvest in addition to the harvest of crops. It only follows that this would justify Njorthr's relationship with Freyr as his ancient father. Both of these deities are of fertility and wealth, one of land, the other of the sea, one supplying wealth with the rain, the other with favorable winds, one at Uppsala, the other at Noatun. And while Freyr is expressed as a god of prosperity, Norther is described as a deity already in possession of grand wealth, such that Snorri records that he is one to give offering to when in search of valuables or land ownership. This leads to Snorri's record of Njorthr in the Heimskringla, in which Snorri briefly employs euhemerism, that is, the casting of the gods as human beings. In the Heimskringla, Njorthr is described as a human king and the father of Freyr, who eventually succeeds him. But along with that narrative, Njorthr fills an interesting role as high priest in charge of communal sacrifices along with Freyr. In fact, we see this coupling with Freyr across multiple attestations and sagas in which they are invoked together, suggesting that Njorthr once held many of the roles that were eventually filled later on by Freyr. Njorthr is said to have been raised among the Vanir and was exchanged as a hostage at the end of a debilitating war between the Aesir and the Vanir. In this expression, though, of the word hostage here, it is not suggested that Njorthr lived as a prisoner among the Aesir, but as an agent of cultural exchange in order to promote peace. Now, this explains his placement as a high priest in charge of sacrifice, Odin, trusts Njorthr, a foreign deity to his society, to become a leader within that society and effect change for the better. Now, there is, of course, the attestations of Njorthr in a sibling marriage to his sister, who remains unnamed in the sources. Snorri mentions this in the Heimskringla, and Loki uses this information to insult Njorthr in the Lokasana in the Poetic Edda. And it's important to note that Loki's insults in this story are not random. They seem to be rooted in references to other stories. However, nothing is known of this sister or her character, but there are some theories relating to this matter, as well as some diverging ideas on these theories. The popular theory, which is deemed the most likely, is that this sister is Nerthus, a goddess attested in Tacitus's record Germania over a thousand years prior, and... It's true. This name appears to be a feminization of Njorthur's name. There do seem to be similar associations between Njorthur and Nerthus. Tacitus even describes the island where Nerthus's idol, meant to be taken from town to town, is kept. Similar such islands are the type of place to be named for Njorthur, suggesting that perhaps Njorthur was at one point associated with some of these practices as well. This would put the brother-sister naming scheme in a similar place as Freyr and Freya, which mean lord and lady, a brother and sister also accused of sleeping together by Loki, and the son and daughter of Njorthr. If that seems clear-cut to you, well, nothing is as it seems, as there is another possibility informed by the fact that we have literally no information about Njorthr's sister— British folklorist H.R.E. Davidson notes a particular island in which the place name can be translated to Bath of Norther, 
drawing similarities to the bathing of the idol of Nerthus as noted by Tacitus. And Tacitus makes no mention of a brother deity to Nerthus. So it's possible that these place names for Nerthur were formally attributed to Nerthus. And this, along with the similarity in the name, has led to the supposition that Nerthur and Nerthus are actually the same deity. And this would make Nerthur a transmasculine deity. Now, this isn't exactly strange in Germanic myth, as Odin and Loki are both represented as gender fluid in various legends, and the possibility of Njorthur being transmasculine isn't me inserting some personal narrative into this, as I'm sure someone will attempt to accuse me of doing. In fact, this possibility has long been a part of scholastic writing about Njorthur, and the supposition that Njorthur and Nerthus are the same deity with a gender transition over time has been put forward as a possibility by Old Norse Studies scholar E.O.G. Tervil Petre going back as far as the 1960s, and again expressed by Professor of Norse Folklore John Lindau in the 2000s. At that point, ignoring this out of some personal preference or what have you, would be the effect of inserting a personal narrative instead of acknowledging it and discussing it. So, is this a matter of historical fact? No. And as I stated, scholastically, Nerthus as Northur's sister is considered more likely. There isn't a settled understanding on the matter of whether or not Nerthus and Northur are the same deity or distinct deities, and there probably never will be, short of finding more written sources. But the possibility that Northur is transmasculine is a possibility backed by scholastic study on the matter. And the reasoning is very interesting. There's even textual evidence that I've already mentioned in this video. It seems that many of the rituals associated with Freyr were inherited from practices related to Nerthus. However, the invocations of Freyr in common with Njorthur suggests that this inheritance was actually from Njorthur, not Nerthus. Unless they were the same deity and the practices associated with Nerthus were later done in the name of Njorthur. In addition to this, we have evidence in language and myth that not only might Njorthur be transmasculine, but that Skathi might be transfeminine, as her name seems to have a masculine origination. The mythological evidence is the strange placement of gender roles in the story of the marriage between Skathi and Njorthur, one of the few stories of either deity that we have access to. Now, in this story, Skathi, goddess of winter, mountains, and the hunt, gathers her weapons, dons armor and helm, and is set out to avenge her father, a typically masculine role in myth. Her quest for revenge is satiated by an offering of a spouse, which in this setting is typically a feminine role, which is filled by Njorthur. Now, despite this, Njorthur is clearly masculine, and Skathi is clearly feminine, but it's possible, even likely, that this story did not originate in this exact telling, and is a clear example of Norse myth bending gender roles, as seems to be common. But this marriage between Skathi and Njorthur was not meant to last. Njorthur is the god of ships and is associated with the sea and the shore. Skathi is the goddess of winter and the hunt and is associated with mountains. These could not be more distinct, and Snorri references an unknown source that apparently describes their marriage more in detail, in which they spend nine nights in each other's homes. The references show that the marriage wasn't agreeable due to their differences. Njorthur had a disdain for the howling of wolves through the night, and Skathi could not sleep to the cries of the seagulls. This resulted in the end of the marriage, and Skathi remains in the mountains. Njorthur remains at Noatun, and their separation seems to be one that is otherwise amicable, only that their marriage did not work, as Skathi remains a celebrated deity among the Aesir. If their divorce had been tumultuous, it's likely that Skathi would have again become a Jotun. It's possible that these two otherwise loved one another, and that their separation is a tragic one. But it's also possible that they were simply incompatible, recognized that, and decided to separate rather than live in a way that was harmful to each other. This would be a very mature model for divorce, recognizing the agency of both parties. It's clear that we're missing a very important source that would give more insight to this matter, but alas, it's probably lost to time. 
There is one last element of Njorthur to bring up, and that is his possible place as a death god. Njorthur is the god of ships, and it's clear that the ship was closely tied to funerary practices of various heathen cultures. We find ship burials across multiple Germanic civilizations, and there is suggestion of the ship being a mode of transport to the afterlife. Ibn Fadlun of the Abbasid Caliphate in the 900s even witnesses a funeral among the Rus, setting a ship aflame for a journey to the afterlife. Now, it's true that there's a more overt relationship with death at sea expressed by Ron, with stories of sailors carrying a gold token for the goddess, who, in reciprocity, takes them to the hold that she shares with Eir. However, there is evidence through usage of ships in burials that Njorthr may perhaps be a guide to the afterlife. The association is only made stronger by Freyr's association with death through burial mounds, but there is no clarifying evidence to expand upon this beyond the ships themselves being used for burials and funerals. Njorthr is a mysterious god, one with more questions than answers, which makes him all the more fascinating. There are many ways to see him or worship him, and many of these approaches can be justified with the information that we have, and through provisionally answering these questions for ourselves in our approach and practice. Now, this doesn't mean that these answers we provisionally give ourselves are true or reflect the reality of history obscured by time, but they can be a way to further our practice and our relationship with Njorthur. Feel free to let me know your thoughts. Given that my name is Ocean, a video on Njorthur was long overdue. I've been out on ships in a number of oceans. I've taken to offering to Njorthur before heading out, be it for fishing or for travel or what have you. A creative way of viewing Njorthur, in my opinion, is offering to him when approaching the unknown. Seafaring at the height of Njorthur's worship was a risky act and could bring you to the edge of the known world. So when engaging in a journey that might put you somewhere unexpected or dealing with the unknown, I find a prayer to Njorthur to be fitting in these situations. But with that, hail to my patrons for making this content possible. It's good to have people at your back. Keep in mind that the uh, like button is hiding in the mountains while the subscribe button resides on the shore. Maybe ringing the bell can bring them together. And remember to find a way or make one.